everybody and welcome to our Talk and Naturally chat today. Um, we are joined by Vivian. Vivian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, certainly. Um, I'm Vivian Kent. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist, conservation biologist. Um, I have been so for um, over 20 years now, but this is my second career, so I'm sure we'll come on to that. Um, and I um, am co-founder of the Otter Network, and um, I run the uh, Northeast Otter Survey every spring. Um, and yeah, so that's mainly what I do at the moment. Wow, fantastic. And I know lots of our listeners will have heard your talk about otters at the university as well. So I look forward to hearing more about that. So Vivian, um, how did you first get into natural history? Um, well, it's interesting because I grew up in the country in the West Midlands, Staffordshire, um, and I was always out in, in the countryside and I was out more than I was in. I mean, all the tales of, you know, in the old days when we used to go out the door at nine o'clock in the morning and come home for tea. <laughs> and that was it. I was ours all the time. But I was never really into naming things and, and knowing what things were, strangely. I just loved being outside in the countryside. So I don't think I really sort of got into um, knowing about natural history until probably... Yeah, probably about 25, 25 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I was a, uh, I used to work um, at the BBC. So I lived in London and I was quite far removed from all kinds of natural history when I was living in London. Although obviously yeah. there's green spaces there as well. Um, and, I, and I was just busy um, with work and I didn't really get into it. But then um, I left the BBC and I took a gap year adult gap here <laughs> and um sometimes uh, necessary traveled um yeah absolutely um and traveled uh, for a year i went to uh, africa india indonesia thailand new zealand australia um and just became completely immersed in natural history from there. Wow. that's kind of when it started so obviously your traveling inspired you but was there anything yeah i mean africa yeah, Africa has always been a thing for me. I've always been um, fascinated by Africa and African um, uh, animals and uh, environment. Um, I think that probably stems, this might sound a little odd, but when I was a child, there was a television series on called Daktari. Um, and Daktari, I think, is Swahili for vet. Okay. And it was about this white colonial vet who lived in Kenya. And all the animals that, you know, that were around in their camp and everything and it was just uh yeah they had a, a cross-eyed lion called Clarence <laughs> and I've just been obsessed with African carnivals ever since then really yeah so the things that form your mind when you're a child <laughs> fantastic and then to go back to it later in life as an adult and sort of see that yeah. that was what your inspiration was yeah and um, so yeah. Yeah. where did otters come from then Where did otters come from? Well, um, when I changed career um, and uh, I uh, specialised in large African carnivals when I was doing um, my master's degree at Oxford and um, my PhD at Durham. Um, so I did my research for my master's on um, uh, African wild dogs. Um, and then for my PhD, I was um, doing research on um, human wildlife conflict between um, uh, farmers in Botswana and large carnivores, um, cheetahs, leopards, hyenas, etc. So I, I was immersed in that for many years. Um, and then when I came back to the UK, well, there aren't too many large African carnivores here to work on. So, <laughs> so um, I kind of just sort of fell into otters, really. I mean, I've always been, you know, fascinated by them. But you, you couldn't see them in this country you know? mm -hmm. for a long time. You couldn't see them. So um, um, I was uh, working for Durham Wildlife Trust. I just started to work for Durham Wildlife Trust. And um, a position came up of um, project officer on the um, Otto project, uh, which I got. And I became an Otto project officer. And it really started there. So that was in 2012. 
Excellent. And what are your most, have you have you got a, a memorable moment, you know, when you started working with otters or when you came back to the UK, what's your most memorable sort of moment in the Northeast with nature? Well, there's so many. I mean, every every encounter with an otter is a, is a memorable special yeah. moment, to be honest. And I've been very fortunate in that I've, you know, I have seen otters on a number of occasions in the Northeast. Uh, and as I say, it was something that you just, didn't see in this country mm -hmm. until the last 15 or so years, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so um, seeing otters is always special. Um, I've always, um, I've had some amazing trips out on the North Sea, um, looking, going out to the Farne Islands and also looking for dolphins and whales on the North Sea, um, you know, off the, off the Northumberland coast. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and birds as well. We have some amazing birds in the northeast. So I don't really think I can isolate one moment. There's just so many. I mean, I think we're just so lucky in the yeah. northeast to have access to such incredible countryside that is just, yeah, brimming mm -hmm. with such incredible uh, natural history and nature, really. It absolutely is. And the Farn Islands are fantastic for nature. Um, being yeah, from absolutely. sea houses I, myself, I, I love. Um, oh, is there any, okay. Yeah. Is there any other places in the northeast that you find, you know, <laughs> if there's a special place that you could go to? Um, again, there's just so many, really. I mean, I love Weirdale and Teesdale. Um, mm -hmm. Going up into the Dales is just fantastic. Um, you know, up, up around Hannah's Meadow, up around there. Um, yeah, Northumberland Coast is just amazing. Um yeah, and really on a day to day basis, I love walking by the River Weir. It's mm -hmm. just fantastic. It's just a um, wonderful, wonderful river. Um, and we're so lucky because, you know, again, sort of 30, 40 years ago, it was a dead river, mm -hmm. as were the other ri major rivers in the northeast. So, um, um, we are very lucky at the moment that we are, we have seen it come back to life. We have, and we've got such beautiful um, countryside and you know, coastal areas in the northeast where we are very lucky. Um, obviously, over the last few years, there's been a biodiversity decline. What could you talk about with um? What have you seen decline sort of significantly? And on the flip side of that, more positively, have you seen an increase in any biodiversity? Well, unfortunately, we've seen pretty much everything decline. Um, insects probably the most noticeable um you know um there's the uh the apocryphal tales of you know when i was a child and you were driving in the summer you used to have to stop every hour to clean the windscreen because there were so many insects scattered on the windscreen and the number plate and now you hardly find any uh which is really really scary to be yeah. honest um so yeah so insects have declined massively um you know, every kind of insect, really. But mammals have declined, too. Um, you know, I think our small mammals have declined. Bats have declined. Birds have obviously declined. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a very scary time. But I suppose the one thing that's, um, that's increased, luckily for me, is actually otters. Because yeah. um, in my life, you know, sort of when I, when I, when I was born, I was, I'm pretty old. I was born in the 1950s. Um, and the otter was virtually extinct in England at that time, you know, um, 50s, 60s and 70s. There were no otters um, mm -hmm. due to pollution, etc. Um, Can you so talk a little bit more about to see that? Them come back. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, during the after the Second World War, there was a huge um, boom in the use of um, organic chlorine pesticides uh, in farming. And they had a major impact um, throughout throughout the food chain, really, but particularly on animals at the top of the food chain, the apex predators, um, not just mammals, but birds as well. Peregrine falcon uh, was particularly affected. Um, uh, it caused uh, thinning, thinning of the eggshells. So when the birds sat on their eggs, the eggs broke so they, uh, they wouldn't hatch. So they became virtually extinct as well. Otters, again, because these um, chemicals biomagnify up the food chain, so they get into the smaller creatures um, and then they're eaten by bigger creatures. So there's more of them, that in the bigger creatures, et cetera, up the food chain. So by the time you get to the top of the food chain, that it's a really toxic cocktail. 
Um, and of course, it kills the smaller animals as well. So there was no, um, it was killing the fish, it was killing the crustaceans. So if there's no food, um, predators can't exist. And there was also um, huge industrial pollution, obviously, as well, mm -hmm. in, um, in the, especially in the Northeast. Um, so as I said before, you know, the time, the, t uh, the weir and the teas were basically dead rivers because of industrial pollution. Um, so you just don't get any um, uh, predators if there isn't any food. Mm -hmm. They are dependent on the food resources. So you have to have a functioning food chain from the bottom up in order mm -hmm. to have predators at the top. And that wasn't um, the case. So um, that has been a huge change in my lifetime. Um, so from the beginning, probably from, yeah, from the turn of the century, um, things started to improve. Um, organic chlorine pesticides were banned in agriculture in the mid 1980s, early to mid 1980s. And then gradually the otter population started to recover. Um, and we're now in the fantastic situation where there are otters present in every county in England, again, mm -hmm. which is you know extraordinary when you think that 40 years ago, there were virtually none. Um, so yeah, that is something which has been a wonderful um, uh, increase in biodiversity. But it's it's very much a, a tale um, going against the tide, really. So, mm -hmm. um, and we don't know how we don't know how stable that population is. I mean, we know that there's lots of um, uh, pollution of our waterways again now. Um, so we don't know what kind of an effect that is happening mm -hmm. having on the otter population. But there is a, a national survey uh, going on at the moment which is being organized by uh, Natural England, the Environment Agency and the Mammal Society. Um, and we'll hopefully we'll get the results of that next year. So we'll have a better idea of how the, the population now compares to what it did when they did the last survey, which was about mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And what would you do then? So obviously if there is a decline, what would be the um, implications of that? And you know what could be done about it? Well, it would depend on what the cause of the decline was, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, then, obviously, water health is the major factor. Um, otters are an indicator species, which means that the health of their population gives us uh, an indication of how healthy our waterways are. Mm -hmm. um, so if the otters are starting to not do well again, then that would certainly imply that our water courses are not in a very good condition so that is something that would you know we would need to address yeah. mm -hmm. are there any other surveys going ahead at the same time that you can sort of monitor and compare with the otter survey uh what what with the national otter survey well there's our there's our survey um which we do every year in the spring yeah uh, in the northeast uh which at the moment um is has shown which we did our 10th survey this year. So um, that has shown a pretty stable population uh, mm -hmm. over that 10 years. But last year, well, sorry, this year, in the 2022 survey, um, the uh, number of territories we detected had did fall slightly. Now that may just have been a blip. Um, yeah. uh, it's not possible to say for sure until um, we can do some more surveys and get yeah. uh, confirmation or otherwise of that data. Um, but uh, there was a national survey done in Wales uh, between 2016 and 2018, and that showed a decline in the otter population. Uh, mm -hmm. So that um, the results of that survey were published this year, and that showed a decline. So that is very worrying. Um, uh, so we'll just have to see whether that is the case in England as well. Yeah. You mentioned quite a few groups there, Natural England. Um, and the otter conservation. Are, are there groups you're involved in? Is there any other groups that you're involved in as well, societies? Uh, well, I'm a, a member of the um, Mammal Society Science Advisory Committee. Um, and uh, I'm a trustee of Durham Wildlife Trust. Um, and I'm also on the board of Mammal Web, which is um, a project that I was involved in when I was mm -hmm. working at um, uh, Durham Wildlife Trust on camera trapping across what well, is across the whole of the country now it started off as a northeast project mm -hmm. um so that's camera trapping for uh to monitor mammals in uh in the uk and further afield as well now yeah so yeah so i'm involved with that um yeah very interesting so based on that then 
what tips could you give to young naturalists? My um, role at the Natural History Society is to engage young naturalists as much as possible in hope that, you know, they can make a difference to our future. Do you have any tips for just people starting out and, and what they can do to help? Get involved with your local wildlife trust, your local um, wildlife groups, um, go out there and volunteer. Um, and um, yeah, do get involved. There's so many opportunities now that just didn't exist before to get involved in citizen science surveys mm -hmm. um, and to do um, uh, all kinds of citizen science research, which is just fantastic opportunity for young people. And to do practical um, stuff as well for, um, for the Wildlife Trust or for Natural History Society of Northumbria um, mm. or for the RSPB if you're interested in, in birds. There's so many different um, avenues now that young people can take to do voluntary work. And I know it's it can be difficult because, you know, it obviously means giving up your time for free. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do have, even if it's only an hour a week, you know, to do something like that, then it can be um, really rewarding and it can really help to um, launch you into a career really in, in natural history and conservation. Mm -hmm. I know you said at the beginning and I sort of rang true with me as well you know you went out at nine o'clock in the morning and you, you came home when the first street light came on and children just don't spend as much time outdoors anymore so they don't have that engagement with nature to then develop that love for it so it's it's trying hard to you know get children to enjoy it to love it to appreciate it and then therefore want to protect it. Yeah and, and to and to yeah just take pleasure in being out there really mm -hmm. and to um, you know, just the sensory experience of being, you know, out in the sunlight and feeling, you know, the wind on your mm -hmm. face and, you know, and just running through the grass and seeing the wildflowers and things like that. And, you know, watching a watching a river and seeing the mini beasts that live in the water and everything. I mean, that kind of thing is just um, so invaluable, really. And just a little personal sort of question. If you could go somewhere in the northeast, sit under a tree or sit by the river weir and pick up a book, what sort of book would you pick up? What would you like to just sit and read and enjoy? Uh, well, if we're talking a natural history book, I think, you know, the book I've enjoyed um, most really out of any book I've read in recent years is um, Wilding by Isabella Tree. Okay, um, which I might is, need to look um, that. Here we go. There we go. Well, oh, lovely. Uh, which, which is the story of um, their transformation of NEP in uh, in Sussex, um, which is um, this uh, sort of three hundred hectare, I think, uh, estate, um, which was a um, uh, intensively farmed uh, estate, arable. Um, and also dairy, and they've rewilded it, and it is now the most extraordinary. Um, they've got nightingales, they've got uh, turtle doves, they've got purple emperor butterflies come back. It's just the most, it's the most um, life affirming and optimistic and hopeful um, story in the midst of so much which is really mm. depressing and not hopeful at the moment. Um, and I would recommend it for anybody, really. So, um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's it's a really inspiring book. And it just shows it can be done as well. You know, when you say there's so much negativity around biodiversity decline, we can make small differences that can be huge, which is fantastic. Yeah. And the thing, the thing is, you know, nature really wants to recover. We only have to give it the slightest opportunity and it mm -hmm. will. Um, we've just got to allow it to do that. Um, just got to take a step back and let it let it do it. And yeah, stop trying to dominate and control everything. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect words there to end. Is there anything else you'd like to add or, you know, anything that you can sort of give a little bit of advice or anything just to just to end the chat today? Uh, I think mainly the thing is just get out there, really. Just get out there and look. And, and just take notice of what you see around you because um, it is extraordinary, um, even the smallest things. I mean, I've recently, um, uh, in the past uh, three or four years, I've got really into dragonflies. Um, so Me I go too. out and record dragonflies in the summer, which 
they are the most extraordinary creatures. They really are. Um, They're beautiful. Magical creatures, they really are. So yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, you can, you know, you can start start on a on a group that interests you and just expand your knowledge gradually. But just start with a, a small, in a small way. Sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming if you're looking, mm-hmm. if you're starting off, because the, oh my god, there's so much. I'm never ever going to. Uh, be able to um, get to grips with all of this but if you mm-hmm. start in a small way and then just expand and expand and expand and you'd be amazed how quickly your knowledge grows fantastic well thank you so much that's been inspirational certainly to me and I'm sure our viewers okay. as well um thank you for your time today and yeah, hopefully we'll get to awesome. chat soon